This series of The Kamla Show from Silicon Valley is brought to you by Zoho Corporation. Zoho is the operating system for business. Hello, I'm Kamla. My guests today are Bill Atkinson and Andy Hertzfeld. Both of them worked at Apple and then they went on to become entrepreneurs and they co-founded a company called General Magic. Both of you joined Apple almost at the same time. Uh, Bill about a year before I did. Okay, 78? Yeah, I joined in 79. 79, okay. And both of you worked at Apple, both worked very closely. You mm -hmm. often say that Bill was your mentor. Yes. And how did you look at Andy? A brilliant programmer with a great heart. I think he kept the, the spirit of the Macintosh more than Steve even. Have you ever heard that? Uh, something like that. Is this the first time you're saying it? Mm hmm So both of you worked very closely. You left Apple 90, uh, 85? March 84. 84. And you continued at Apple mm -hmm. until? Until uh, March of 90, 1990 is when uh, I left Apple to co-found General Magic with Mark Peratt and Andy Hertzfeld. Okay, but then in the interim, in the four or five years before General Magic, you co-founded a company. Yeah. And what did that company uh, It was a company called Radius that I co-founded with my best friend, Burl Smith, the hardware designer of the Macintosh. And we founded Radius to help overcome uh, some of the limitations of the Mac. I think Burl got sick and tired of hearing people say the Mac was unexpandable and had a tiny screen. And meanwhile, we saw desktop publishing arising, uh, where you use the Macintosh to make uh, high quality documents. And the little small screen was hampering it. So we thought if we could attach a large screen to the Macintosh, that would be a fantastic thing. And so Radius was founded to uh, augment the Macintosh, first with a large screen, then we did a, an accelerator. We uh, made it run four times faster using the later Mo Motorola processor, the 68020. So you were still operating the Apple environment? Yeah, yeah. I, even though I quit Apple, I didn't quit the Mac. I loved the Mac. And uh, for about four or five years, just on my own, I wrote various kinds of Macintosh software. So how did this notion for General Magic come about, a company which was supposed to create this, a personal communicator? Uh, well, Mark, Mark Peratt was in the Advanced Technologies Group, and he was tasked with... At Apple. At Apple. Had tasked for, with finding out what comes next after personal computers. And he did, and he did... Uh, he put together a vision that he called the Pocket Crystal. It was about a personal communicator. And um, I, uh, he came and showed his ideas to me, and I said, this is right, this is what we should be doing. Um, and Apple thought they were in the computer business, and they didn't want to make consumer electronic devices. And so, um, and we ended up spinning out General Magic. I would have stayed at Apple, but we couldn't make it at Apple. So we ended up spinning that out, and I enrolled Andy to come uh, help me with that. Uh, we wrote a vision statement at the time uh, to explain what we were doing here. We ha this is 1990. Uh, we have internet, pre-internet. Yes, before the internet, before text messages, before you know. Uh, we, there were beepers. This, yes, there yeah, were still phones, there were pagers. There were cell phones, but they were analog. Analog cell phones, and most of them were big. Those shoebox phones. Yes. We have a dream of improving the lives of many millions of people by means of small, intimate life support systems that people carry with them everywhere. These systems will help people to organize their lives, to communicate with other people, and to access information of all kinds. They will be very simple to use and come in a wide range of models to fit every budget, need, and taste. They will change the way people live and communicate. We are assembling at General Magic a world-class team of hardware, software, and user interface designers to explore and invent these life support systems and to constantly evolve, evolve and improve those inventions. So it was a life support system. Mm -hmm. well, much but, like your phone is today. Yeah. and that's Later we started calling them personal communicators. So that was the vision with which the company was spun off in yep. yes. 1990. <clears throat> 
Yeah. Okay. Let, there's a movie out in 2018, a documentary on gentle magic that takes you behind the scenes and shows in all the excitement with which this company was born and what you were trying to create. Let's take a look at the trailer and okay. then we'll come back and talk about the startup that was spun off from Apple. Sure. In 1990, there was no digital telecommunications industry. It did not exist. There were no digital cell phones. There was no World Wide Web. We're going to create what comes after the personal computer. And it was a telephone. It was essentially going to be a smartphone with a lot of intelligence. In it. When we were talking about reinventing telephony, we meant it. We're trying to make something that people love. We needed to be like your watch, your glasses, your wallet. We decided to make everything. That meant we were custom building every piece. It's, it's insane. And how small will it finally be, do you think? Someday, Dick Tracy wristwatch. This was the beginning of what became, I think, the most important company to come out of Silicon Valley that nobody's ever heard of. OK, we just saw the trailer. My first question is, who came up with the idea of having a camera person into the company and record everything that was happening because we see you, Andy, talking with all with a group of people, uh, with the programmers and developers. So who came up with this idea well, of that was visually a, record? It was really a, for a very short period of time. And what it was for was we were going to make a big public announcement in February 1993. And so to get uh, fodder for, for a little documentary that would be shown there, they started taping our uh, videotaping our meetings. Actually, it was probably filmed, not even videotaped yeah. back, back in those days. Uh, but really, that, only, that was only for a period of, of maybe a week or so. And then there were other times that pe people on, on their own were uh, recording. You created this company. You worked a, at creating this device. When did the first prototype come out? The Remember first prototype mm -hmm. or the first shipping product? Prototype, and then oh. the sh yeah, shipping. Yeah, uh, we had prototype. You know, the prototypes go through various right. stages. Right. First, uh, the first prototype really of the software was just on a Macintosh. We developed the software on, on Macs, even though it didn't have the touch. And then, but at the same time, we started uh, putting together a device we could use. I would say we had something in about eight months or so. So maybe by the end of 1990, we had, they were really pretty clunky. I remember the blue plastic, they were about that thick. Uh, but we did have early prototypes and then. And the touch screen was pretty hard to, to yes. press. It, you, you couldn't swipe, swipe gently. You had to push on it. Okay, so the haptic uh, touch. No, no, not the haptic. It's just a matter of, there, there weren't, like, Today's sensors are capacitive sensors that sense a very gentle touch. These sensors were two resistive sheets with little glass beads between them, and you had to push down and deform the, oh. the plastic to make it to make a contact. And then, uh, so it was good for poking at, but it wasn't really very good for it, for swiping on. Right. Okay, so you had certain bottlenecks. Well, we had so many. The just the technologies uh, that we have today just weren't. They there. weren't there. So. Uh, there were lots of examples where you had to compromise compared to today. Now, the whole notion of having this personal uh, communicator, as you have mentioned uh, somewhere that I read, is to have these postcards dropping from the yeah. ether, right? Yeah. And they would so you know, we had this dropping out of the sky into your pocket. So that is what... And we call that a telecard. So think of a postcard, a little picture on one side and turn it over and write a little message on the other side and send it off into the ether and and your daughter looks in her pocket ah I got a telecard from dad so this notion I guess today we would call it Instagram mm. right well, <laughs> well if you want to see what it was like uh, Bill has a fantastic application the iOS app store called photo card yeah uh, I've that's seen that. like a hundred and ten percent really of what we had uh, for the teletouch. So this is because we are talking about a post-computer, post-personal computer era, where you needed to shrink the form factor of the device and bring it, ha hold it in your hand. That actually was the radical thing that you were trying to do. Were there any other companies trying to create, I think the word then was PDA, personal digital assistant, was a word sometimes well, that is Apple, Apple surprised us by coming out with the Newton. We didn't know they were working on that. Why would they do that? Uh, I don't know the politics behind it, but I 
So I understand Scully was getting a lot of pressure. Why is he supporting General Magic? And well, the Newton predated General Magic. It was a, a fairly big project even before Mark Peratt started uh, at Apple. I didn't but know it that. was yeah, yeah. But it oh. was uh, their vision was uh, I call the Dynabook vision of Newton. It was eight and a half by eleven, nothing like your pocket. It was the size of a piece of paper, uh, and it was targeted to cost five thousand dollars. So a very, very different type of device. Later, after General Magic spun out, there was a, a crucial decision they made because the Dynabook version of Newton was foundering. They couldn't get the screens. Uh, they were using a weird program, programming language that called Dylan that didn't work out. Uh, and so uh, in order to save it, uh, Steve Capps and a guy named Michael Chow decided to uh, sort of copy General Magic. And that was... Uh, ill-fated decision for, for both projects. When did the final product come out? Because here you are working, the company was in existence for 10 years, right? Uh, something like that. Um, okay. Really though, the, the general magic that Bill and I worked out was six or seven years. And then because we had money in the bank from the IPO, we could restart again, but Bill and I weren't involved with that. So 10 years encompasses the whole thing, but more like six, six and a half years for the general magic that we know and love. When did the Motorola, uh, when did the, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the Sony, Sony the, so, the, so, the Sony uh, magic, Link. magic Link shipped in August of 19, well, no, we finished the software in August. Then very shortly after that, I think it was probably like September of 1994, you could buy the first general magic device called the Sony Magic Link. And then considerably later than that, another four or five months, the Motorola device that was truly wireless came out. So that was probably around the end of 94, early 95. I have faint recollections of General Magic from that period because you dominated the news cycle quite a bit. I remember that. Uh, and when I talk to people and when I tell them, oh, I'm going to be talking to somebody that founded or co-founded General Magic, they, there's excitement in their eyes. They're like, oh, really? So it looks like the company left an indelible impression on many people's mind, not the millennials, but those who <laughs> <laughs> lived in the 20th century. So I... Uh, uh, the company... Well, I wish they would have bought more of the devices. Why, so why did they... <laughs> well, so what happened? You, you, you introduced this uh, product to the market. What happened? Why so, did it first not... of all, it was too expensive. Uh, How much was it? The Sony one was almost $900. And when you're selling walkie-talkies, you have to have, always buy at least two of them. Right? right. We wanted each person in the family to have one and send notes back and forth to each other. Now, that doesn't happen at a $900 price point. Uh, second, the hardware was uh, pretty lunky. It was, it was big, and it, wasn't, it wouldn't fit in your pocket. But I normally have my phone in my pocket. Um, so uh, what would be the form factor of Gentle Magic? Uh, this big. Yeah, probably. Like uh, this? The this Sony big? Magic more, more Link was twice. about that yeah, big. Yeah, that's about right. So it yeah. would be this big, and then ye yeah. thick? How thick was it? Half an inch? Oh, yeah. oh it was yeah. thick. Oh, so like a book, like a... Yeah, like a paperback book. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, that's one reason. Another reason is uh, that uh, the meteoric rise of the internet yeah. happened and drew attention away. Uh, who would want a telecard transceiver when you could have a computer that could do web pages, color web pages? This was grayscale. Uh, they could do, um, you know, I think we just sort of got, uh, all of a sudden, the people working on the project, and we had people from 20 major consumer electronic giants all working with us, and they pulled their guys away to go work on the internet because that's what was happening. So you missed That's in the 1993, and this thing didn't come out till 1994 or five? Four. So you missed that Thank internet you. boat bus? Yeah, it was a giant wave, but we were we were swimming in another another direction. When you were within the company, you must have heard that there's this new thing called the internet that's come. Yeah, it's not really the internet. The internet existed 10, it's 15 right. years. The World Wide Web. The World Wide Web. Yeah, the World Wide Web. The Mosaic had yes. come. So yes. Mosaic came in in 93. Yes, yes. and then uh, what and is it, Netscape? Yeah, 
Netscape. I remember Netscape when Mosaic, Navigator. when somebody showed me the Mosaic, I would, it blew my mind in 93, yes. I remember that. Right, and at first there were, you know, you could list all the websites in the world on two pages. Right, right, right. And right. It, but then it, it blossomed and there's, you know, lots and lots of web pages. Uh, but those really needed at least 1024 by 768 of color to display correctly. Uh -huh. If we had tried to display one of them on our magic link, it would have looked terrible. And we did try. Uh, <laughs> it did look terrible. <laughs> we, we, did, we did have a web browser in a subsequent version of, of Magic App, but as Bill said, it, it, the hardware wasn't really suitable for, for the web. Is General Magic a good instance of a company that was founded uh, at the wrong time, but with the right ideas? The wrong time because it was... I don't know. I think if, yeah. if we had gotten some of the other things right, it, we might have been able to, to make it work. What uh, would be... The first, the first, you know, in any revolutionary technology, uh, the first iterations of it are, are going to have some issues. Uh, but you hope the inherent worth of it is enough to, to get over the hump. Uh, and, you know, we, if... if Enough people had bought the the first the first one. Uh, uh, the next year, a better one would come out, and a better one. And within a few years, uh, we could have realized the vision. I don't think it was impossible. That said, it, you know, maybe if we were five years later, we would have had a a better chance to succeed. So why did you leave uh, the company then? Why did both of you leave the company? The initial impetus had had run its course. We we came out with the devices. They flopped. Um, they, you know, changes were in order. Sometimes uh, the original founders are a little too attached to, to take the nest, make the necessary changes. Uh, we were also, uh, at least speaking for myself, I was really tired after working really hard for six years. And I left to pursue my nature photography. I realized we had failed. Um, and. It's true, we failed to get the device out into the, the marketplace, but a lot of the ideas didn't fail. A lot of the ideas sowed seeds that later gave rise to Android. I mean, Andy Rubin was a General Magic employee. And uh, what did Tony he do? Fidel, he, in, Work, he invented- Work communications and engineer. Yeah. Oh, so, the, uh, so he, he worked on communication side of yes. General Magic. And then Magic. later he, he uh, came up with Android that, uh, but yeah, I think the, the reason the reason that documentary's there and the uplifting part of it was the incredible team we assembled at right. General Magic right. that went on to do amazing things uh, that really did take root in the world. Not just Android, but Tony Fidel uh, was the leader of the team that designed the hardware for the iPhone as well as the iPod. Uh, but we and had then he went Kevin on Lynch. To... I got my Apple Watch here. He's the guy in charge of the Apple Watch project at Apple today. But he came goes... from Adobe, Kevin Lynch. Uh, no, he, after no, General Magic. He... Oh, he went to Adobe after General yeah, Magic. Yeah, he worked at General Magic for four years. Tony Fidel co-founded uh, Nest. Yeah, yeah, way later. Yeah, way later. So, after Apple. So uh, he learned a lot, I guess, by... That was his first uh, job. Yeah, yeah. Tony was just fresh out of college when we when we hired him. Okay. But I would say we had a dozen employees who went on to do great things in the world. Megan Smith, the chief technical officer of the United States. John G. Andrea, who was leading uh, all of Google's artificial intelligence and now leads all of Apple's. Uh, Pierre and, and P yeah, eBay. Or Amidar. eBay came directly out of General Magic. So you had a very illustrious uh, group that went on, you know, they were trained. In some ways, we were an incubator. Yeah. <laughs> ah. No, and it's really a story of redemption because uh, to a large degree, the younger employees did fulfill the vision of General Magic 20 years later. So when you look at this phone today, you know, uh, what visions come before you, you know, uh, do you have regrets? Do you have uh, happiness that this is out there? Because I'm, I'm thinking Steve Jobs. This is what we wanted to make. But the Steve Jobs. But did we ever... couldn't. Now we can. It was, it was built. But did Steve Jobs ever look at a prototype of a general magic yes. device? Yeah, I gave him one. Uh, he was the first person I gave one to uh, once, once we had enough to give away. I mean, uh, in I those days, telecard correspondence with Steve that lasted about two weeks, <laughs> maybe about six telecards sent total. But he General didn't Magic use used a software keyboard, and yes. uh, back then the common wisdom was that it's better to use a little chiclet keyboard with a whole lot of little buttons like the BlackBerry, and uh, 
the iPhone ended up using a, a software keyboard. And Steve explicitly told me that um, because of his experience using the Magic Link, he knew a projected keyboard w would work. Oh, so the one that we have here, yeah, the projected keyboard on the iPhone. Yes. That was something that was... We had that on the, on the Magic Hub yes. devices. So what other features of General Magic are now, do we see on these... Oh, well, we had, when we had these little postcards, you could put little little uh, emojis on them ah. and even animated ones. And uh, when you got the card, the, the little candlestick would be walking across the card. Uh, we had... Um, we had voice notes. You could actually uh, record a little bit of sound and you can hear your daughter speaking to you when you, you, you touch it. Um, you know, we have voice messages now. Voice memos. Uh, well, we also have, even when our text messages, yes, you can yes. type or you can talk a message and if you want to you hear that. Um, a, lot of, I, a lot of the things that we were trying to do in General Magic just weren't, quite doable and later became doable. I th I'd say we didn't invent the iPhone, but we sowed some seeds that other people built on top. When the iPad first came out, Steve Jobs sent me one with oh. a note and it said, uh, enjoy, yeah. this has some of your DNA in it, Steve. So he acknowledged that some of the ideas in the iPhone and the iPad came from the Try what we what we attempted to do at General Magic. Did did he send you an iPad too? Yeah, I did. He did. He didn't send me an iPhone, but he did send me an iPad. Did he say, send a similar message? That yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, he said something like, uh, "Hope you write some apps" or something like that. Oh, okay. So he was aware, or he paid homage to your well, work. I would call homage. He probably sent sent about a hundred of them out to different people, but. Uh, yeah, yeah was, I was I impressed because usually I thought he was pretty stingy. And uh, yeah. <laughs> he sent he didn't he sent me the top of the line one. <laughs> he didn't send me yeah. the, the the cheapest one. The iPad one. Yeah. Uh, the first version. Yeah. First time, it didn't have cellular because that wasn't available at the time. Right, right, right. But the, the biggest one that, you know, that was available at the time he sent to me. Sometimes when you work for a successful company like Apple, you get used to being successful and get used to shipping out products and software updates and other things and getting feedback from people saying, yes, you know, thanks to you, we got this product out. But with a company like General Magic, which had such grand vision and even brought out a product, but it failed to take off. What does it leave you with? You know, what are the residual feelings that you have? I would say mixed feelings. Uh, obviously, it doesn't feel good to fail. You know, you, you, you invest your hopes and dreams and it, it doesn't come to something. So there's a bad side of it. But then uh, Steve used to say when we were working on the Macintosh, the journey is the reward. Uh, it's not the end result as much as the process that took you there. And so getting to work with Bill and, and so many brilliant people, uh, I look back on that very fondly, and I'm glad I, I did that work. And the General Magic movie um, has actually kind of been kind of healing for me because I've had a, a, a sense of failure, a sense of shame, a sense... A sense I, of shame? Yeah. I, I convinced my friends to come and work on this project. I convinced Andy among others, but many of my many of the people at General Magic were people I knew long before General Magic existed. And I said, hey, come and work on this cool project. And when we failed, I felt responsible. I had lured them into this thing. And one of the things that the movie did for me is remind me, hey, we did have a lot of fun and there are fruits of what we did that even though the products didn't sell, the ideas did go far, and people who cut their teeth in General Magic ended up doing great things mm -hmm. out, uh, afterwards. And I bet you none of them regret it. Yeah. That's what I've been finding is yeah. people, people, you know, I lured Megan Smith to come there, and she's still delighted that she came there. Yes. She would not undo it. If she knew we were going to fail exactly as we did, she said, I would have I signed up anyway. Yep. But I'm surprised that you use the word shame, especially in Silicon Valley. Well, it's embarrassing to fail, right? It is, but in Silicon Valley, one of they the things... They trusted me. They trusted my judgment that this was a good thing to do. They trusted my judgment that we could succeed. And we couldn't, we didn't succeed. So now you feel 
a little better after having seen the film, because now we've had to, you, you've had the time. Puts it in perspective. Mm. One of the things that happens, you know, if a, if a relationship ends, you tend to remember the last part of that relationship instead of the whole length of it. Um, when my wife of 28 years died, I remembered a lot of the times that she was suffering with cancer. And in a, making a memorial for her, I made photographs from all, all our 28 years together. And I remembered, wow, we did have some beautiful times together. The movie was kind of like that. The General Magic movie reminded me not just that we failed and that all these investors lost their money and all these friends that I had brought here had to encounter a product that didn't succeed um, by looking at kind of the whole time span of the, the, the project, I got a, a better feel for, um, there was a lot of good in it too. It wasn't all, you know, I tend, tend to remember the last parts and I'm embarrassed and, and feel like a, a failure. Um, but I, I, looking at the bigger picture, I see we did succeed in some ways. Yeah, and over three quarters of any new companies you start are going to fail. That's part of the process of, of, of being successful is to try out things, knowing that everything you try is not going to work. If you were to redo the company all over again, what would you do? We had too many partners for one thing. Uh, each, you know, once Sony was a great company that was great to partner with, but when we brought in their blood enemy, Matt Schuster, that weakened Sony's commitment. So I would have started smaller. The other thing I, I would definitely d done is I, I would just be a demon about trying to ship something as soon as possible. Boy, get the essence of the idea out in the world and learn. Get instead, feedback. Instead of trying to craft something, you know, very grand. You know, that was one, one of my biggest mistakes, was, the rule, not, was not focusing right. on the core enough. The rule of thumb is, okay, that's the vision. What's the first step? Yes. And we didn't do that. We, we wanted to make the vision. We, were, we bit off more than we could share. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your story about working with General Magic and uh, what you learned from it. You know, sometimes it's important to share that so that we could also learn because one of the points you made is uh, that we should have got the essence out to the world before, and sometimes we are sitting there whittling away and crafting a perfect yes. product. Yeah. Right? So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll be back again with another conversation. Until then, goodbye. This series of The Kamla Show from Silicon Valley is brought to you by Zoho Corporation. Zoho is the operating system for business.